and one way is that we use it. So, uh, our course is building the first artificial intelligence that understands code. Uh, the first step to this is analyzing all online open source. Uh, we are currently analyzing 70 million repositories. That's every repository on GitHub that is not a fork. And we are now uh, creating a new pipeline to analyze more than 60 million repositories. So that includes uh, all GitHub forks, but also uh, Git repositories uh, hosted uh, everywhere else. So this is a task that is, requires a very intensive use of Git. So our first uh, problem was choosing a Git implementation. The usual choices are uh, the Git command line interface or libgit2, which is a C library that uh, has bindings for many languages, and jgit, uh, which is also a very nice uh, library in Java by Google. But uh, the language of choice at source is Go, so uh, none of these as they are uh, fit our stack nicely. So when we started, our options in Go were git to go which are the official uh, bindings for libgit2, which are really complete. Um, but uh, they require C Go, which is not that nice for us. And, and it's not possible for us to extend it in the way we needed uh, from Go. Uh, so that was kind of discarded. Uh, there's also some nice uh, command line interface wrappers. Uh, they work really fast because, well, they just execute Git. Uh, the official Git implementation is awesome, uh, it's really fast, but uh, they are very inflexible. Uh, we cannot extend the underlying Git behavior. And there, are a lot of, there were a lot of pure Go implementations, uh, but most of them were abandoned uh, just at uh, the very early stage uh, because I guess that most people, a lot of people start a, Go, a Git implementation, but then figures out it's actually much bigger than what he thinks. So um, our choice was doing it from scratch, and uh, that's how Go Git was born. Um, uh, so we wrote uh, the full Git implementation in Pugo uh, with idiomatic API for both uh, high and low level. In Git terminology, that's known as uh, plumbing and porcelain commands. And we have a focus on extensibility. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. So we aim to be comparable feature-wise with libgit2 and jgit. Uh, we are still not there, but we are working towards, towards it. We already put two years of development into it, uh, so we, we, are, we are on track. So why do we want to extend, uh, why do we focus on extensibility? One of the first things that we needed to extend is uh, storage backends. Uh, storage backends in GoGit define how Git objects, references, configuration, and so on are stored. Um, so we provide two implementations with GoGit itself. One is just an uh, in-memory storage backend that you can use for testing or also for uh, processing repositories uh, really fast if they fit in memory. And then a virtual file system uh, implementation uh, that uses a, a virtual file system abstraction uh, that, that is open source. This, you can check it, this Go Billy. Uh, but you can plug your own. And in fact, we have implementations that use uh, databases as Cassandra as a backend. Uh, we have implementations that are uh, storage backend wrappers for doing catching. So there are a lot of possibilities to this. Uh, another other in interesting extension points are work trees as virtual file systems. So you are not limited to take out a, uh, to take out a commit into the, into the disk. You can check out in um, in memory or in a database or anywhere that you can implement a virtual file system interface. And we can also plug transports. So we implement all uh, standard uh, Git transports, uh, SSH, HTTPS, and so on. But we can also plug your, our own. Um, we actually use it for performance functions in some cases. So um, let's go through our use case. The first building block for analyzing all repositories online is having a local copy of every repository in our cluster 
so we can process it uh, faster and on demand. So we are fetching repositories from GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, Samana, uh, self-host repositories that we crawl from Google. Um, we, we are trying to be very uh, extensive here. But this leads to the first problem, which is fork redundancy. Um, the vast majority of repositories uh, that you find online are forks. Um, in, in fact, in, in GitHub, there are like 70 million repositories, and there are like 60 million uh, if you add fork. So if we store master branch, only the master branch of all GitHub non forks, uh, we get uh, around 70 terabytes. If we add forks to that, we get 240 terabytes. That's only the master branch, so this is a lower bound. Um, but most though of that data is just redundant. Uh, most forks are just a copy of the original repository uh, plus a couple of commits. So if blue represents forks, we don't really want to store all of those copies that are 90% redundant data. They just take too much space in our, our cluster for, for nothing. So we solve it by looking at forks just as a namespace set of references of the original repository. So for us, uh, we can see the fork as it's just the same as the original repository, but it just has some branches that are pointing to somewhere to, to a different part of the history. So we store all the forks of the same repository together in the same local repository in our storage. So they share all objects. If a commit or a file is present in, uh, in multiple forks of the same repository, the, that commit, that file is just not stored twice. Uh, we superfix each reference or branch with an ID of the repository that it was fetched from, so we can still distinguish between them. So let's, let's see an example. Let's, let's say that this is the history of the GoGit repository. The, the real one is actually longer, but um, we have <laughs> three commits here, and we have a couple of uh, forks, and they just uh, share most of their history with the original repository, and they just add a commit, uh, probably for doing a full request. So if we store them together, it just looks like this, a single repository, three branches, and we prefix each branch with uh, the original repository so we can still distinguish. But there's still a problem. So how do we say that the repository that we fetch is a fork from another? Uh, we could rely on name, uh, but there are forks that have different names than the original repositories, and there are repositories that have the same name and are completely in independent. For example, like, there are five repositories that are called GoGit, um, well, and they are completely unrelated implementations. We could rely also on the GitHub API, but um, that works only on GitHub, of course. And even on GitHub, it only works if you created the fork using the GitHub web interface. So yeah, that's not going to fly for us. What we do is we take advantage of the fact that a fork starts at the same set of initial commits as the original repository. So it might have longer or shorter history, it might have more branches, but if you go to the first commit that was done to the repository, the hash of that commit is actually the same for, for all forks. So in our local stats, we don't, we don't store a repository per remote name of the repository, but we create a repository for each hash of initial commit that we saw. And then we fetch a repository, we, f we push each branch to a local repository that corresponds to the hash of, uh, of its initial commit. So this, wo this works uh, nicely across all Git providers because just relies on Git and, on, uh, and not in any heuristic or any external API. <coughs> so this is actually how our local storage looks like. We don't store forks. Uh, we just store their incremental parts, and we merge together, uh, see if these reds are uh, forks from the same repository, we just store one of them uh, containing the information of all of them. So then, we reduce uh, the required storage to minimum, uh, but, but still have access to all uh, information. The next problem for building this, uh, this mirror and, and using it for analyzing 
is that is, is where do we store it? So we need a storage that is oriented to uh, bus repository analysis. So when we open uh, our, our repository, we open it for analyzing the whole history. In our use cases, it's unlikely that we, that we want to open a repository to let just a commit. Um, so we distributed file system for this. Uh, we have used uh, HDFS and Google Cloud Storage. Uh, the good thing about these file systems is that they have really high throughput. Um, they have uh, the counterpart that they have high latency. And Git repository is composed of many files. If you look into the .git directory of your repository, you will see one or more pack files, you will see index files, uh, reference files, you will see a config file. Uh, so if we want to analyze a repository, we need all of that. But in some cases, um, this, the time that we spend, uh, the latency of accessing all of these files adds up. At some point, for some repositories, we spend more time just waiting for uh, input output operations to start rather than, rather than the actual data transfer. And this gets worse every time we update the repositories because every time we pull, we get more files. Um, so this is performance scale that just gets worse over time. So how do we solve it with GoGuit? We create an, uh, we create an efficient archiving format, for, efficient for this use case. It's called SIBA. Uh, we archive each repository as a single file. We have a custom trust backend baked into GoGuit um, that operates on archived repositories transparently without extracting them and um, performs updates to, the, updates to them in the most efficient way for both uh, SIBA and HDFS Google Cloud Storage. So we just, we baked all the implementation details of this into this storage backend and now we can uh, just use GoGit uh, transparent with this kind of repository. You can read more details, implementation details about this in our blog. Uh, all the details about uh, how this format is designed and so on are, are there and it's also open source so you can use it for, for other stuff. So, what I told you uh, up to now is uh, one of our main use cases. Uh, I would like to highlight um, a couple of projects uh, that use GoGit and that uh, might be interesting for the Go audience. Uh, one is GitUL, which is a SQL interface to Git. And you can just uh, use it to, you can run it on like, any Git repository and you can write SQL queries against the repository. Um, very soon it will be implemented as a Go database driver, so you will be able to connect, I don't know, on your ORM to your Git repository. It's a pretty crazy thing to do, but you can. Um, we also have a Go stable. It's a service, uh, it's a self-hosted service. Uh, it's like uh, the Go package.in service that is done for, uh, does any, um, who of you know gopackets.in? Right, less people than I thought in the world. So, um, he, with gopackets.in, you can provide URLs uh, to, uh, to Git repositories uh, that point to specific branches. And you can use that for in your Go imports for making imports that are stable and do not depend always on the master branch. Um, Go in is the most popular service for doing that, but you can use Go Stable to run your own on your own domain with public and private repositories. So let's recap. Um, Go Git um, is working with Git in Go, very simple and idiomatic. Um, we have been using it for more than one year in production uh, with millions of repositories. So even if the feature set is not complete, uh, there's already a very solid base there. And we have implemented a lot of uh, advanced use cases in Go that would otherwise um, be quite a, a help to implement in, in you know, for example, like recently um, a new kind of Git storage was presented by Microsoft and they do something that is similar to our storage backends. Uh, but using the, the Git command line interface. 
So they had to implement a kernel driver uh, with a new virtual system for doing that uh, in a pretty complex way. And in every case, that was just like th uh, 300 lines of code. So here you have the project um, URL and GitHub, uh, the stable, uh, stable version import, uh, the development version import. You see that what Go stable does. We have this fancy, uh, fancy URL for our imports. Um, well, that's all. Thank you. Um, I think we have uh, quite a lot of time for questions. Um, yeah, kind of quite like lightning talk. So, hi. Um, how big is the is the project currently? Maybe in number of lines of code or something? And uh, how much uh, would grow in the future to to get to the same uh, capabilities as lib uh, git or or jgit? Yeah. So. Size, I will have to check out. Does any of my calls know what the size in lines of code? Uh, well, the good thing about having time is that. Sorry? Yeah, I think that it's quite tricky because hey, my, my screen is blacked out, so I have to type like this. But I don't know what's maybe 30,000 slides of code. Maybe, I'm not sure. So, uh, we implement, uh, so up to now we have implemented uh, everything that we need for repository analysis, uh, which is not what most users want. So, we can clone, fetch, pull, push. We have a client and server side for both of, of those. We can traverse repositories. Um, we can generate divs, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's pretty complete on that side. Uh, one of the major missing parts is creating commits. So if you actually want to create new commits uh, programmatically, that's not there yet. Uh, but it should be the next uh, stable release. Um, when we will be on par with JGit or LibGit 2, uh, so maybe fully on par fully probably years. So yeah, not not anytime soon. Anytime soon. Uh, but for the features that we implement, um, we implement a lot of possibilities for extending the behavior that you do not have with those libraries. So, yeah. Does that answer the question? Hi. Yeah. Ah, okay, you have the mic. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for talking. You said that you can define the repositories for the first commit. How do you deal with the boilerplate rep repositories that are used just based for many products? Yeah. Um, so there are um, a couple of cases. One easy one is um, you know, like boiler, boilerplate that copy as an initial, initial, as initialization, such as the git ignore uh, file. That, but in those cases, the hash of the first commit is different because the commit includes your author name, the timestamp, and the commit message. So even if you start a, a, a repository with the same content as a different one, but you have like Octopress or these static page generators that you use clone. And, and yeah, so currently we just, um, we just um, store all of them as forks. Um, which actually is also what GitHub does internally, um, and we don't differentiate among them. We see all the web pages, uh, completely independent web pages done by different people, as forks of the same project. Uh, we analyze all of them, but we interpret them as, uh, as forks. So we didn't get into the problem of solving this, um, but we might try some stuff in the future, such as trying to detect a point in time where the code base diverted a lot between them. Um, I guess it will be definitely possible to, to do that. Uh, the only thing is that that's very computationally expensive. So 
in our case, um, for example, I, but only because of our use case, we are focusing on code, and we don't care that much, for example, about the, the usual example of uh, static generated pages. Um, actually, they are quite bad for us because we are trying to understand how people codes, uh, and those contain a lot of auto-generated code. Uh, we don't want to interpret your auto-generated code as if it was written by you, because I mean, you are not writing the code. Uh, but yeah, I guess we will have to do something in the future. So, okay. so um, I have a question regarding your fog detection um, algorithm. Uh, do you support detecting git graft, you know, when you graph two repositories in one? Yeah, it's really tricky. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, so I saw a simple example um, uh, where there was only a one initial commit. But if you take the official git repository, the, the git, <coughs> git repository, it has seven initial commits or seven root commits. Um, in our case, uh, in our application, we make the distinction of root commit, which are all roots have no parent. Um, and we made this arbitrary de uh, definition of uh, the initial commit, which is root commit. Uh, so for a reference, is the root commit that you reach by going through the history only following the first parent. So when there is a merge, we only follow the first parent and we always read the same initial commit. So Git has uh, seven uh, root commits, but only one of them is initial commit. It's, uh, it's actually the first, the proper, the, the proper first Git commit, and the other were like tools and things that were merged into that over time. Um, and we store all of that in the initial commit. Um, if you have a fork, that uh, in the case that you merge two different repositories, um, you still have some forks um, that might have a different, different initial commit, even if they serve part of the history. They will be stored independently in our storage. And we are now trying to figure out, uh, so now currently that duplicates that information in some edge cases. Now we are trying to figure out if we use Git alternates uh, to, to even share information in, in those cases. Um, that's still a work in progress. Thank you. So um, my question is regarding the extensibility of it. Um, so you mentioned that it's easy to write, easy, uh, to write new stats backends. Yep. Um, Mo only supports um, static leaking, right? So you have to kind of fork the project and create it and make a kind of compiling plugin or something like that, or? I mean, go, go get this library. It's not meant for, for writing a command line client. I mean, you could write a command line client with go git, which in fact we are kind of doing, but just for, as an example. Um, so if you do your own storage again, you will be using an application, and in that application you will be also, you will be importing go git, you will be importing your storage backend, and you will be passing it go git. So, yeah, how does static linking affect that? Yeah, will yep, yep. I mean, that's the intended use case. It will be more like tri tricky if you want to do the git command line uh, where where you can plug a storage backend as a plugin on runtime, right, or something like that. Uh, we don't, we don't try to do that at the moment. That would be a good contribution. Yeah, cool. Any other question? All right. So thank you.